I had the opportunity last week of doing something I haven't done for a couple of decades. And that was leading communion education for children. I did this at First Congregational Church of Holliston, where my family are members and I am an affiliate member. Uh, the initial plan fell through on Wednesday. So who are you going to call? <laughs> <laughs> and so I learned that it really is possible to dig back 40 years for the original lesson plan. Who knew it was still in here? <laughs> and you know it stands up. I was very happy uh, with how it went, which shows I did good work 40 years ago. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was wonderful to talk with the children about their understanding of communion. Uh, broadly small church in terms of Sunday school, broadly graded. So I had teenagers and I had kindergartners. Mm -hmm. That was the, the age range. And to see them interact with each other and listen to each other mm -hmm. was in fact communion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking how hard it is on this World Communion Sunday to speak about any kind of unity in the place where we are now. It's really hard. Tomorrow will be October 7th, a year, at least 43,000 people are dead who were alive a year ago. And I don't know about you, but I can't wait for this election to be over. <laughs> I've seen so many commercials about the governor's race in New Hampshire that I don't like either of those women. Shame on us. Shame on us. We seem so far away from God's peace, God's shalom, the communion of all God's children, the care of God's creation for all who dwell below the skies. And one of the readings for this week comes from the letter to Hebrews kind of a, an odd book, not really a letter, kind of a sermon, doesn't follow the literary forms, uh-oh, written for a second generation of believers. Huh. Incorporating bits and pieces of circulating theological formulas and texts with a goal to rekindle faith in the face of persecution. The letter to the Hebrews, which is more of a sermon than a letter, is both teaching and encouraging people who are facing hard times and are acknowledging, as we continue to acknowledge, that we are in between times. Jesus has lived, died, been resurrected, and ascended. And we are still waiting for the rest of the story, even while, excuse me, while we are the rest of the story. And this scripture has real meaning for me. And as I was doing my research, um, most of the people, the commentators I looked at, wanted to say something important about 
Again, a, a formula, a, a text that was added to this scripture to describe the relationship between God and Jesus and human beings. And so I'm going to do something I hardly ever do. I'm going to go back to an older translation from the Revised Standard Version. And having grown up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we know that's what God really wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. We continue to grow in our understanding in translation. Uh, but one of the things that's happened along the way, and this is something I usually celebrate, is that singular things have become plural, have been made plural. So rather than man, we say human ones or human beings. And rather than son of man, we talk about offspring. All very good, except in this particular <laughs> passage, uh, the writer of the letter to Hebrews is doing something very specific. And so I'm just going to read a section from the Revised Standard Version. For it is not to the angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, somewhere being the book of Psalms, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou carest for him? Thou didst make him for a little while lower than the angels, and thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, God left nothing outside his control. As it is, we do not see everything in subjection to him. But we do see Jesus, who for a while was lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. This scripture speaks powerfully to what we see and what we do not see yet. And so when Psalm 8 is quoted, it's to apply Psalm 8 directly to Jesus. What is man, that thou art mindful of him, the son of man, which was a title for Jesus eventually, that thou carest for him. Jesus... <coughs> is presented here as the fully human one, at least lower than the angels, at least for a little while, and as being crowned with glory and honor, putting everything under subjection, under his feet, fully God. And that's the truth. And so we can nod and say, yes, that's the truth. We know that's the truth. But, and I think for me this is the key verse, as it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. We do not see the kingdom of heaven in its fullness. We aren't there yet. Yet. But we do see Jesus. And we can make a lifetime of discipleship seeing Jesus. We read Gospels almost every Sunday. And there are so many stories of Jesus. There are parables. There are healing stories. There are stories about Jesus teaching his disciples along the way. There are stories of Jesus teaching multitudes. 
But there's more. Early in the, the 80s, when I was just giving up the Revised Standard Version, <laughs> Sally McFaig, a professor then at, at Vanderbilt, wrote a book called Metaphorical Theology. Hmm. And she talked about the actions of Jesus as enacted parables. So there are parables that Jesus taught. The kingdom of heaven is like a man going down a road. The kingdom of heaven is, is like a mustard seed. But Jesus not only told parables, in some sense, he was a parable. We went through a period of time where people were wearing bracelets that said, WWJD, <laughs> what would Jesus do? One of my very creative Christian educator friends changed that to, what WDJD, what did Jesus do? Hmm. How did Jesus treat other people? How, with, how was he with the human ones? Who did he eat supper with? Who was he willing to talk with that other people would not even get close to? What did Jesus do? And so I invite you into an, an act of imagination, and I invite you back into those Gospels to say what else? What else? What did Jesus do? And how is that a parable of what the kingdom of heaven really includes? <clears throat> As I was coming in, some people were kindly remembering that I did spend some time in Tennessee. My first call was in Memphis, who would have guessed? <laughs> Little Miss Princeton goes to Memphis. <laughs> and I was, this is the 80s, and so we're talking about women who are really proud to say they're feminist. And I was invited to a group to come, to be on a panel. And this was a group, a, a, a feminist spirituality group. And when I got there, I suddenly realized that I was there to be the conservative. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> little, Miss, little Miss Princeton goes to Memphis with her degree from Princeton and is now the conservative. Uh -huh. Because the group was mostly women who had left church. Some were Roman Catholic, some were Methodist, some were Baptist. Um, you know, the two biggest going concerns in Memphis were the Southern Baptist Church and the Church of Christ. And I don't mean the UCC, I mean the Church of Christ. In which women had no standing other than helpmate and producer of children. So here we are with this very enlightened, <laughs> radical group of theologians on a Saturday morning in Memphis, Tennessee, in about 1986. And I realized I get to be the conservative that day. I never get to be the conservative. <laughs> it was fabulous. And so I listened to their stories, and they were stories of deep pain mm -hmm. of feeling totally left out, diminished, ignored at best, castigated at worst. And so I listened and listened and listened and then 
Finally, it was my turn to speak. And I said, oh gosh, you know, I hear your pain and I know you are speaking of profound truth. But I can't give up on Jesus. I said, I just can't. I can't give up on Jesus. I can't give up on Jesus and the Samaritan woman. I can't give up on Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. I can't give up on Jesus eating with all kinds of dirty riffraff. I can't give up on him. I can't give up on Jesus calling Zacchaeus out of that tree. Something we all learned, at least I did at vacation Bible school. Still know the song. I can't give up on that. I can't give up on what Jesus did. And you know, they got a little misty. And they said, oh, Jesus, yeah. It's like, we forgot about him. <laughs> Which, of course, they hadn't. But their experiences in church that were formed over millennia mm -hmm. had so masked the faith mm -hmm. that they weren't seeing Jesus. And so when I go back and read this passage, we don't see the kingdom of heaven in its fullness, we don't. And we're still waiting. It's been a long wait. It seems like it could go on a while longer. And we look at the world and we see war and death and brokenness and injustice. We see hurting people. And we see Jesus. And we see Jesus especially if we decide we want to look further. It involves not being willing to give him up. And it involves not willing to give up. That's what this letter is about. Listeners are assured that they can be both faithful and hopeful. And the exaltation of Jesus by God is their assurance. And what they can lean on is Jesus' solidarity with the human ones, the faithful ones, who follow the way of Jesus and live like faithful, loving, hopeful believers in the face of persecution, in their case, and in the face of indifference in our case. The word to them is don't abandon Jesus. Don't abandon your community. Don't fall away. We don't see everything we want to see or believe we will see, but we do see Jesus. I often find that Facebook memes coming in during the week, have something to say to my sermon. And this, this week it was a meme uh, quoting Corey Ten Boom, who in Holland, um, she and her family sheltered Jews. And when they, they were discovered, uh, she and her sister were sent to Ravensbrück and the rest of her family was killed. And 
Corrie Ten Boom spent the rest of her life, her, her dear sister died in camp, but Corrie Ten Boom spent the rest of her life preaching forgiveness and talking about how she had come face to face with one of the guards. And he had offered his hand and she had decided to take it. She said, we must mirror God's love in the midst of a world of hatred. We must mirror God's love in the midst of a world of hatred. We are the mirrors of God's love, so we must show Jesus by our lives. And in that way, we become enacted parables. We come to the table on World Communion Sunday I was listening in the car to how different groups will be marking October 7th. Lord God, pray for peace. But all I could think about was that the God who spoke to us through Jesus is also God and Father of the Jews, Adonai and is Allah, one God. And so while we usually talk about communion with other Christians throughout the world, I had so much fun with the kids last week. I thought, how do I communicate this to you know kids who are not abstract thinkers yet? We used to make kids wait until they were abstract thinkers. We don't do that anymore. And so I asked them, where would you like to go outside of this country? And whether they were five or whether they were 17, they all had a place. And I said, so I want you to visualize when we come to the table that you are having communion there with them. And so I want you to visualize <laughs> that we are having communion, not only globally, but cosmically. We do not see the kingdom of God in its fullness, but we do see Jesus at the table. And may we mirror his love in our lives now. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Amen.